John Ronald Ruel Tolkien was an English writer, poet, philologist, and academic, best known as the author of the high fantasy works The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. He served as the Rawlinson and Bosworth Professor of Anglo-Saxon and Fellow of Pembroke College, Oxford from 1925 to 1945 and the Merton Professor of English Language and Literature and Fellow of Merton College, Oxford from 1945 to 1959. He was a close friend of C. S. Lewis, a co-member of the informal literary discussion group The Inklings. Tolkien was appointed a commander of the Order of the British Empire by Queen Elizabeth II on 28 March 1972. After Tolkien's death, his son Christopher published a series of works based on his father's extensive notes and unpublished manuscripts, including The Silmarillion. These, together with The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, form a connected body of tales, poems, fictional histories, invented languages, and literary essays about a fantasy world called Arda and, within it, Middle-earth. Between 1951 and 1955, Tolkien applied the term legendarium to the larger part of these writings. While many other authors had published works of fantasy before Tolkien, the great success of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings led directly to a popular resurgence of the genre. This has caused Tolkien to be popularly identified as the father of modern fantasy literature or, more precisely, of high fantasy. In 2008, the Times ranked him sixth on a list of the 50 greatest British writers since 1945. Forbes ranked him the fifth top-earning dead celebrity in 2009. Tolkien's immediate paternal ancestors were middle-class craftsmen who made and sold clocks, watches and pianos in London and Birmingham. The Tolkien family originated in the East Prussian town Kreuzberg near Königsberg, which was founded during medieval German eastward expansion, where his earliest known paternal ancestor Michel Tolkien was born around 1620. Michael's son Christianus Tolkien 1663-1746 was a wealthy miller in Kreuzberg. His son Christian Tolkien 1706-1791 moved from Kreuzberg to nearby Danzig, and his two sons Daniel Gottlieb Tolkien 1747-1813 and Johann later known as John Benjamin Tolkien 1752-1819 emigrated to London in the 1770s and became the ancestors of the English family. The younger brother was J. R. R. Tolkien's second great-grandfather. In 1792 John Benjamin Tolkien and William Gravel took over the Erdley Norton manufacture in London, which from then on sold clocks and watches under the name Gravel and Tolkien. Daniel Gottlieb obtained British citizenship in 1794, but John Benjamin apparently never became a British citizen. Other German relatives also joined the two brothers in London. Several people with the surname Tolkien or similar spelling, some of them members of the same family as J. R. R. Tolkien, live in northern Germany, but most of them are descendants of people who evacuated East Prussia in 1945, at the end of World War II. According to Richard Derdzinski, the Tolkien name is of low Prussian origin and probably means, son, descendant of Tolk. Tolkien mistakenly believed his surname derived from the German word Tolkun, meaning foolhardy, and jokingly inserted himself as a cameo into the Notion Club papers under the literally translated name Rashbold. However, Derdzinski has demonstrated this to be a false etymology. While J. R. R. Tolkien was aware of the Tolkien family's German origin, his knowledge of the family's history was limited because he was early isolated from the family of his prematurely deceased father. John Ronald Ruel Tolkien was born on 3 January 1892 in Bloemfontein in the Orange Free State later annexed by the British Empire, now Free State Province in the Republic of South Africa, 
to Arthur Ruel Tolkien 1857-1896, an English bank manager, and his wife Mabel, née Suffield 1870-1904. The couple had left England when Arthur was promoted to head the Bloemfontein office of the British bank for which he worked. Tolkien had one sibling, his younger brother, Hilary Arthur Ruel Tolkien, who was born on 17 February 1894. As a child, Tolkien was bitten by a large baboon spider in the garden, an event some think later echoed in his stories, although he admitted no actual memory of the event and no special hatred of spiders as an adult. In another incident, a young family servant, who thought Tolkien a beautiful child, took the baby to his kraal to show him off, returning him the next morning. When he was three, he went to England with his mother and brother on what was intended to be a lengthy family visit. His father, however, died in South Africa of rheumatic fever before he could join them. This left the family without an income, so Tolkien's mother took him to live with her parents in Kings Heath, Birmingham. Soon after, in 1896, they moved to Sarehole now in Hall Green, then a Worcestershire village, later annexed to Birmingham. He enjoyed exploring Sarehole Mill and Moseley Bog and the Clent, Licky and Malvern Hills, which would later inspire scenes in his books, along with nearby towns and villages such as Bromsgrove, Ulster, and Alvechurch and places such as his Aunt Jane's Farm Bag End, the name of which he used in his fiction. Mabel Tolkien taught her two children at home. Ronald, as he was known in the family, was a keen pupil. She taught him a great deal of botany and awakened in him the enjoyment of the look and feel of plants. Young Tolkien liked to draw landscapes and trees, but his favorite lessons were those concerning languages, and his mother taught him the rudiments of Latin very early. Tolkien could read by the age of four and could write fluently soon afterwards. His mother allowed him to read many books. He disliked Treasure Island and the Pied Piper and thought Alice's Adventures in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll was amusing but disturbing. He liked stories about Red Indians, Native Americans and the fantasy works by George MacDonald. In addition, the fairy books of Andrew Lang were particularly important to him and their influence is apparent in some of his later writings. Mabel Tolkien was received into the Roman Catholic Church in 1900 despite vehement protests by her Baptist family, which stopped all financial assistance to her. In 1904, when J.R.R. R. Tolkien was 12, his mother died of acute diabetes at Fern Cottage in Rednall, which she was renting. She was then about 34 years of age about as old as a person with diabetes mellitus type 1 could survive without treatment, insulin would not be discovered until two decades later. Nine years after her death, Tolkien wrote, My own dear mother was a martyr indeed, and it is not to everybody that God grants so easy a way to his great gifts as he did to Hilary and myself, giving us a mother who killed herself with labor and trouble to ensure us keeping the faith. Before her death, Mabel Tolkien had assigned the guardianship of her sons to her close friend, Father Francis Xavier Morgan of the Birmingham Oratory, who was assigned to bring him up as good Catholics. In a 1965 letter to his son Michael, Tolkien recalled the influence of the man whom he always called Father Francis. He was an upper-class Welsh Spaniard Tory, and seemed to some just a pottering old gossip. He was, and he was not. I first learned charity and forgiveness from him, and in the light of it pierced even the liberal darkness out of which I came, knowing more about Bloody Mary than the mother of Jesus, who was never mentioned except as an object of wicked worship by the Romanists. After his mother's death, Tolkien grew up in the Edgebaston area of Birmingham and attended King Edward's School, Birmingham, and later St. Philip's School. In 1903, he won a foundation scholarship and returned to King Edward's. While in his early teens, 
Tolkien had his first encounter with a constructed language, Animalic, an invention of his cousins, Mary and Marjorie Inkledon. At that time, he was studying Latin and Anglo-Saxon. Their interest in Animalic soon died away, but Mary and others, including Tolkien himself, invented a new and more complex language called Nevbosh. The next constructed language he came to work with, Nefaran, would be his own creation. Tolkien learned Esperanto some time before 1909. Around the 10th of June 1909 he composed the Book of the Fox Rook, a 16-page notebook, where the earliest example of one of his invented alphabets appears. Short texts in this notebook are written in Esperanto. In 1911, while they were at King Edward's school, Tolkien and three friends, Rob Gilson, Jeffrey Bache Smith and Christopher Wiseman, formed a semi-secret society they called the TCBS. The initials stood for Tea Club and Barovian Society, alluding to their fondness for drinking tea in Barrow's stores near the school and, secretly, in the school library. After leaving school, the members stayed in touch and, in December 1914, they held a council in London at Wiseman's home. For Tolkien, the result of this meeting was a strong dedication to writing poetry. In 1911, Tolkien went on a summer holiday in Switzerland, a trip that he recollects vividly in a 1968 letter, noting that Bilbo's journey across the misty mountains, including the glissade down the slithering stones into the pine woods, is directly based on his adventures as their party of twelve hiked from Interlaken to Lauterbrunnen and on to camp in the moraines beyond Murren. Fifty-seven years later, Tolkien remembered his regret at leaving the view of the eternal snows of Jungfrau and Silberhorn, the Silvertine celebdal of my dreams. They went across the Kleiner Scheidegg to Grindelwald and on across the Gross Scheidegg to Meiringen. They continued across the Grimsel Pass, through the Upper Valley to Brig and on to the Alech Glacier and Zermatt. In October of the same year, Tolkien began studying at Exeter College, Oxford. He initially studied classics but changed his course in 1913 to English language and literature, graduating in 1915 with first-class honours. Among his tutors at Oxford was Joseph Wright, whose primer of the Gothic language had inspired Tolkien as a schoolboy. At the age of 16, Tolkien met Edith Mary Bratt, who was three years his senior, when he and his brother Hilary moved into the boarding house where she lived in Duchess Road, Edgbaston. According to Humphrey Carpenter, Edith and Ronald took to frequenting Birmingham tea shops, especially one which had a balcony overlooking the pavement. There they would sit and throw sugar lumps into the hats of passers-by, moving to the next table when the sugar bowl was empty. With two people of their personalities and in their position, romance was bound to flourish. Both were orphans in need of affection, and they found that they could give it to each other. During the summer of 1909, they decided that they were in love. His guardian, Father Morgan, considered it altogether unfortunate that his surrogate son was romantically involved with an older, Protestant woman. Tolkien wrote that the combined tensions contributed to his having muffed his exams. Morgan prohibited him from meeting, talking to, or even corresponding with Edith until he was 21. Tolkien obeyed this prohibition to the letter, with one notable early exception, over which Father Morgan threatened to cut short his university career if he did not stop. On the evening of his 21st birthday, Tolkien wrote to Edith, who was living with family friend C. H. Jessup at Cheltenham. He declared that he had never ceased to love her, and asked her to marry him. Edith replied that she had already accepted the proposal of George Field, the brother of one of her closest school friends. But Edith said she had agreed to marry Field only because she felt on the shelf, and had begun to doubt that Tolkien still cared for her. She explained that, because of Tolkien's letter, everything had changed. On 8 January 1913, 
Tolkien traveled by train to Cheltenham and was met on the platform by Edith. The two took a walk into the countryside, sat under a railway viaduct, and talked. By the end of the day, Edith had agreed to accept Tolkien's proposal. She wrote to Field and returned her engagement ring. Field was dreadfully upset at first, and the Field family was insulted and angry. Upon learning of Edith's new plans, Jessup wrote to her guardian, I have nothing to say against Tolkien, he is a cultured gentleman, but his prospects are poor in the extreme, and when he will be in a position to marry I cannot imagine. Had he adopted a profession it would have been different. Following their engagement, Edith reluctantly announced that she was converting to Catholicism at Tolkien's insistence. Jessup, like many others of his age and class, strongly anti-Catholic, was infuriated, and he ordered Edith to find other lodgings. Edith Bratt and Ronald Tolkien were formally engaged at Birmingham in January 1913, and married at St. Mary Immaculate Roman Catholic Church, Warwick, on the 22nd of March 1916. In his 1941 letter to Michael, Tolkien expressed admiration for his wife's willingness to marry a man with no job, little money, and no prospects except the likelihood of being killed in the Great War. In August 1914, Britain entered the First World War. Tolkien's relatives were shocked when he elected not to volunteer immediately for the British Army. In a 1941 letter to his son Michael, Tolkien recalled, In those days chaps joined up, or were scorned publicly. It was a nasty cleft to be in for a young man with too much imagination and little physical courage. Instead, Tolkien, endured the obloquy, and entered a program by which he delayed enlistment until completing his degree. By the time he passed his finals in July 1915, Tolkien recalled that the hints were becoming outspoken from relatives. He was commissioned as a temporary second lieutenant in the Lancashire Fusiliers on 15 July 1915. He trained with the 13th Reserve Battalion on Cannock Chase, Rugeley Camp near to Rugeley, Staffordshire, for 11 months. In a letter to Edith, Tolkien complained, Gentlemen are rare among the superiors and even human beings rare indeed. Following their wedding, Lieutenant and Mrs. Tolkien took up lodgings near the training camp. On the 2nd of June 1916, Tolkien received a telegram summoning him to Folkestone for posting to France. The Tolkiens spent the night before his departure in a room at the Plough and Harrow Hotel in Edgebaston, Birmingham. He later wrote, Junior officers were being killed off, a dozen a minute. Parting from my wife then. It was like a death. On the 5th of June 1916, Tolkien boarded a troop transport for an overnight voyage to Calais. Like other soldiers arriving for the first time, he was sent to the British Expeditionary Forces Base Depot at Aetaples. On the 7th of June, he was informed that he had been assigned as a signals officer to the 11th Service Battalion, Lancashire Fusiliers. The battalion was part of the 74th Brigade, 25th Division. While waiting to be summoned to his unit, Tolkien sank into boredom. To pass the time, he composed a poem entitled The Lonely Isle, which was inspired by his feelings during the sea crossing to Calais. To evade the British Army's postal censorship, he developed a code of dots by which Edith could track his movements. He left Aetaples on 27 June 1916 and joined his battalion at Rubempre, near Amiens. He found himself commanding enlisted men who were drawn mainly from the mining, milling, and weaving towns of Lancashire. According to John Garth, he felt an affinity for these working-class men, but military protocol prohibited friendships with other ranks. Instead, he was required to take charge of them, discipline him, train him, and probably censor their letters. If possible, he was supposed to inspire their love and loyalty. Tolkien later lamented, the most improper job of any man.
is bossing other men. Not one in a million is fit for it, and least of all those who seek the opportunity. Tolkien arrived at the Somme in early July 1916. In between terms behind the lines at Boozingcourt, he participated in the assaults on the Schwaben Redoubt and the Leipzig salient. Tolkien's time in combat was a terrible stress for Edith, who feared that every knock on the door might carry news of her husband's death. Edith could track her husband's movements on a map of the Western Front. The Reverend Mervyn S. Evers, Anglican chaplain to the Lancashire Fusiliers, recorded that Tolkien and his brother officers were eaten by hordes of lice, which found the medical officer's ointment merely a kind of hors d'oeuvre and the little beggars went at their feast with renewed vigor. On 27 October 1916, as his battalion attacked Regina Trench, Tolkien contracted trench fever, a disease carried by lice. He was invalided to England on 8 November 1916. Many of his dearest school friends were killed in the war. Among their number were Rob Gilson of the Tea Club and Barovian Society, who was killed on the first day of the Somme while leading his men in the assault on Beaumont Hamel. Fellow TCBS member Jeffrey Smith was killed during the battle, when a German artillery shell landed on a first aid post. Tolkien's battalion was almost completely wiped out following his return to England. According to John Garth, Kitchener's army at once marked existing social boundaries and counteracted the class system by throwing everyone into a desperate situation together. Tolkien was grateful, writing that it had taught him a deep sympathy and feeling for the Tommy, especially the plain soldier from the agricultural counties. A weak and emaciated Tolkien spent the remainder of the war alternating between hospitals and garrison duties, being deemed medically unfit for general service. During his recovery in a cottage in Little Hayward, Staffordshire, he began to work on what he called the Book of Lost Tales, beginning with the fall of Gondolin. Lost Tales represented Tolkien's attempt to create a mythology for England, a project he would abandon without ever completing. Throughout 1917 and 1918 his illness kept recurring, but he had recovered enough to do home service at various camps. It was at this time that Edith bore their first child, John Francis Ruel Tolkien. In a 1941 letter, Tolkien described his son John as conceived and carried during the starvation year of 1917 and the great U-boat campaign round about the Battle of Cambrai, when the end of the war seemed as far off as it does now. Tolkien was promoted to the temporary rank of lieutenant on 6 January 1918. When he was stationed at Kingston-upon-Hull, he and Edith went walking in the woods at nearby Ruse, and Edith began to dance for him in a clearing among the flowering hemlock. After his wife's death in 1971, Tolkien remembered, I never called Edith Luthien but she was the source of the story that in time became the chief part of the Silmarillion. It was first conceived in a small woodland glade filled with hemlocks at Ruse in Yorkshire where I was for a brief time in command of an outpost of the Humber garrison in 1917, and she was able to live with me for a while. In those days her hair was raven, her skin clear, her eyes brighter than you have seen him, and she could sing and dance. But the story has gone crooked, and I am left, and I cannot plead before the inexorable Mandos. On the 16th of July 1919 Tolkien was taken off active service, at Fovent, on Salisbury Plain, with a temporary disability pension. On 3 November 1920, Tolkien was demobilized and left the army, retaining his rank of lieutenant. His first civilian job after World War I was at the Oxford English Dictionary, where he worked mainly on the history and etymology of words of Germanic origin beginning with the letter W. In 1920, he took up a post as reader in English language at the University of Leeds, becoming the youngest professor there. While at Leeds, he produced a Middle English vocabulary and a definitive edition of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight with E. 
v. Gordon. Both became academic standard works for several decades. He translated Sir Gawain, Pearl, and Sir Orfeo. In 1925, he returned to Oxford as Rawlinson and Bosworth Professor of Anglo-Saxon, with a fellowship at Pembroke College. In mid-1919, he began to tutor undergraduates privately, most importantly those of Lady Margaret Hall and St. Hugh's College. Given that the women's colleges were in great need of good teachers in their early years, and Tolkien as a married professor then still not common was considered suitable, as a bachelor Don would not have been. During his time at Pembroke College Tolkien wrote The Hobbit and the first two volumes of The Lord of the Rings, while living at 20 Northmore Road in North Oxford. He also published a philological essay in 1932 on the name, Nodens, following Sir Mortimer Wheeler's unearthing of a Roman Asclepion at Lydney Park, Gloucestershire, in 1928. In the 1920s, Tolkien undertook a translation of Beowulf, which he finished in 1926, but did not publish. It was finally edited by his son and published in 2014, more than 40 years after Tolkien's death and almost 90 years after its completion. Ten years after finishing his translation, Tolkien gave a highly acclaimed lecture on the work, Beowulf, The Monsters and the Critics, which had a lasting influence on Beowulf research. Lewis E. Nicholson said that the article is widely recognized as a turning point in Beowulfian criticism, noting that Tolkien established the primacy of the poetic nature of the work as opposed to its purely linguistic elements. At the time, the consensus of scholarship deprecated Beowulf for dealing with childish battles with monsters rather than realistic tribal warfare. Tolkien argued that the author of Beowulf was addressing human destiny in general, not as limited by particular tribal politics, and therefore the monsters were essential to the poem. Where Beowulf does deal with specific tribal struggles, as at Finsburg, Tolkien argued firmly against reading in fantastic elements. In the essay, Tolkien also revealed how highly he regarded Beowulf, Beowulf is among my most valued sources, this influence may be seen throughout his Middle-earth legendarium. According to Humphrey Carpenter, Tolkien began his series of lectures on Beowulf in a most striking way, entering the room silently, fixing the audience with a look, and suddenly declaiming in Old English the opening lines of the poem, starting with a great cry of Huat. It was a dramatic impersonation of an Anglo-Saxon bard in a mead hall, and it made the students realize that Beowulf was not just a set text but a powerful piece of dramatic poetry. Decades later, W. H. Auden wrote to his former professor, thanking him for the unforgettable experience of hearing him recite Beowulf, and stating the voice was the voice of Gandalf. In the run-up to the Second World War, Tolkien was earmarked as a codebreaker. In January 1939, he was asked to serve in the cryptographic department of the Foreign Office in the event of national emergency. Beginning on 27 March, he took an instructional course at the London HQ of the Government Code and Cipher School. He was informed in October that his services would not be required. In 1945, Tolkien moved to Merton College, Oxford, becoming the Merton Professor of English Language and Literature, in which post he remained until his retirement in 1959. He served as an external examiner for University College, Dublin, for many years. In 1954 Tolkien received an honorary degree from the National University of Ireland of which UCD was a constituent college. Tolkien completed The Lord of the Rings in 1948, close to a decade after the first sketches. The Tolkiens had four children, John Francis Ruel Tolkien the 17th of November 1917, the 22nd of January 2003, Michael Hillary Ruel Tolkien the 22nd of October 1920, the 27th of February 1984, 
Christopher John Ruel Tolkien, the 21st of November 1924, the 16th of January 2020, and Priscilla Mary Ann Ruel Tolkien, born the 18th of June 1929. Tolkien was very devoted to his children and sent him illustrated letters from Father Christmas when they were young. During his life in retirement, from 1959 up to his death in 1973, Tolkien received steadily increasing public attention and literary fame. In 1961, his friend C. S. Lewis even nominated him for the Nobel Prize in Literature. The sales of his books were so profitable that he regretted that he had not chosen early retirement. In a 1972 letter, he deplored having become a cult figure, but admitted that even the nose of a very modest idol cannot remain entirely untickled by the sweet smell of incense. Fan attention became so intense that Tolkien had to take his phone number out of the public directory, and eventually he and Edith moved to Bournemouth which was then a seaside resort patronized by the British upper middle class. Tolkien's status as a best-selling author gave them easy entry into polite society, but Tolkien deeply missed the company of his fellow inklings. Edith, however, was overjoyed to step into the role of a society hostess, which had been the reason that Tolkien selected Bournemouth in the first place. The genuine and deep affection between Ronald and Edith was demonstrated by their care about the other's health, in details like wrapping presents, in the generous way he gave up his life at Oxford so she could retire to Bournemouth, and in her pride in his becoming a famous author. They were tied together, too, by love for their children and grandchildren. In his retirement Tolkien was a consultant and translator for the Jerusalem Bible, published in 1966. He was initially assigned a larger portion to translate, but, due to other commitments, only managed to offer some criticisms of other contributors and a translation of the Book of Jonah. Edith died on 29 November 1971, at the age of 82. Ronald returned to Oxford, where Merton College gave him convenient rooms near the High Street. He missed Edith, but enjoyed being back in the city. Tolkien was made a commander of the Order of the British Empire in the 1972 New Year Honours and received the insignia of the Order at Buckingham Palace on 28 March 1972. In the same year Oxford University gave him an honorary doctorate of letters. He had the name Luthien engraved on Edith's tombstone at Wolverkit Cemetery, Oxford. When Tolkien died 21 months later on 2 September 1973 from a bleeding ulcer and chest infection, at the age of 81, he was buried in the same grave, with Beren added to his name. Tolkien's will was proven on 20 December 1973, with his estate valued at £190,577 equivalent to £2,322,000 in 2019. Tolkien's Roman Catholicism was a significant factor in C. S. Lewis's conversion from atheism to Christianity, although Tolkien was dismayed that Lewis chose to join the Church of England. He once wrote to Rainer Unwin's daughter Camilla, who wished to know the purpose of life, that it was to increase according to our capacity our knowledge of God by all the means we have, and to be moved by it to praise and thanks. He had a special devotion to the Blessed Sacrament. You will find romance, glory, honor, fidelity, and the true way of all your loves upon earth, and more than that. He accordingly encouraged frequent reception of Holy Communion, again writing to his son Michael that, the only cure for sagging of fainting faith is communion. He believed the Catholic Church to be true most of all because of the pride of place and the honor in which it holds the Blessed Sacrament. In the last years of his life, Tolkien resisted some of the liturgical changes implemented after the Second Vatican Council, especially the use of English for the liturgy. He continued to make the responses in Latin, ignoring the rest of the congregation. 
Tolkien's fantasy writings have often been accused of embodying outmoded attitudes to race. However, scholars have noted that he was influenced by Victorian attitudes to race and to a literary tradition of monsters, and that he was anti-racist both in peacetime and during the two world wars. With the late 19th century background of eugenics and a fear of moral decline, some critics saw the mention of race mixing in The Lord of the Rings as embodying scientific racism. Other commentators saw in Tolkien's orcs a reflection of wartime propaganda caricatures of the Japanese. Critics have noted, too, that the work embodies a moral geography, with good in the West, evil in the East. Against this, scholars have noted that Tolkien was opposed to peacetime Nazi racial theory, while in the Second World War he was equally opposed to anti-German propaganda. Other scholars have stated that Tolkien's Middle Earth is definitely polycultural and polylingual, and that attacks on Tolkien based on the Lord of the Rings often omit relevant evidence from the text. During most of his own life conservationism was not yet on the political agenda, and Tolkien himself did not directly express conservationist views, except in some private letters, in which he tells about his fondness for forests and sadness at tree felling. In later years, a number of authors of biographies or literary analyses of Tolkien conclude that during his writing of The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien gained increased interest in the value of wild and untamed nature, and in protecting what wild nature was left in the industrialized world. Olkin's fantasy books on Middle-earth, especially The Lord of the Rings and The Silmarillion, drew on a wide array of influences including his philological interest in language, Christianity, mythology, archaeology, ancient and modern literature, and personal experience. His philological work centered on the study of Old English literature, especially Beowulf, and he acknowledged its importance to his writings. He was a gifted linguist, influenced by Germanic, Celtic, Finnish, and Greek language and mythology. Commentators have attempted to identify many literary and topological antecedents for characters, places and events in Tolkien's writings. Some writers were important to him, including the arts and crafts polymath William Morris, and he undoubtedly made use of some real place names, such as Bag End, the name of his aunt's home. He acknowledged, too, John Buchan and H. Ryder Haggard, authors of modern adventure stories that he enjoyed. The effects of some specific experiences have been identified. Tolkien's childhood in the English countryside, and its urbanization by the growth of Birmingham, influenced his creation of the Shire, while his personal experience of fighting in the trenches of the First World War affected his depiction of Mordor. In addition to writing fiction, Tolkien was an author of academic literary criticism. His seminal 1936 lecture, later published as an article, revolutionized the treatment of the Anglo-Saxon epic Beowulf by literary critics. The essay remains highly influential in the study of Old English literature to this day. Beowulf is one of the most significant influences upon Tolkien's later fiction, with major details of both The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings being adapted from the poem. This essay discusses the fairy story as a literary form. It was initially written as the 1939 Andrew Lang Lecture at the University of St. Andrews, Scotland. Tolkien focuses on Andrew Lang's work as a folklorist and collector of fairy tales. He disagreed with Lang's broad inclusion, in his fairy book collections, of traveler's tales, beast fables, and other types of stories. Tolkien held a narrower perspective, viewing fairy stories as those that took place in fairy, an enchanted realm, with or without fairies as characters. He viewed them as the natural development of the interaction of human imagination and human language. In addition to his mythopoeic compositions, Tolkien enjoyed inventing fantasy stories to entertain his children. He wrote annual Christmas letters from Father Christmas for them, 
building up a series of short stories later compiled and published as the Father Christmas Letters. Other works included Mr. Bliss and Rove Random for Children, and Leaf by Niggle Part of Tree and Leaf, The Adventures of Tom Bombadil, Smith of Wooten Major and Farmer Giles of Ham. Rove Random and Smith of Wooten Major, like The Hobbit, borrowed ideas from his legendarium. Tolkien never expected his stories to become popular, but by sheer accident a book called The Hobbit, which he had written some years before for his own children, came in 1936 to the attention of Susan Dagnall, an employee of the London publishing firm George Allen and Unwin, who persuaded Tolkien to submit it for publication. When it was published a year later, the book attracted adult readers as well as children, and it became popular enough for the publishers to ask Tolkien to produce a sequel. The request for a sequel prompted Tolkien to begin what became his most famous work, the epic novel The Lord of the Rings originally published in three volumes in 1954-1955. Tolkien spent more than ten years writing the primary narrative and appendices for The Lord of the Rings, during which time he received the constant support of the Inklings, in particular his closest friend C. S. Lewis, the author of The Chronicles of Narnia. Both The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings are set against the background of the Silmarillion, but in a time long after it. Tolkien at first intended The Lord of the Rings to be a children's tale in the style of The Hobbit, but it quickly grew darker and more serious in the writing. Though a direct sequel to The Hobbit, it addressed an older audience, drawing on the immense backstory of Beleriand that Tolkien had constructed in previous years, and which eventually saw posthumous publication in The Silmarillion and other volumes. Tolkien strongly influenced the fantasy genre that grew up after the book's success. The Lord of the Rings became immensely popular in the 1960s and has remained so ever since, ranking as one of the most popular works of fiction of the 20th century judged by both sales and reader surveys. In the 2003 Big Read survey conducted by the BBC, The Lord of the Rings was found to be the UK's best-loved novel. Australians voted The Lord of the Rings, my favourite book, in a 2004 survey conducted by the Australian ABC. In a 1999 poll of Amazon.com customers, the Lord of the Rings was judged to be their favorite book of the millennium. In 2002 Tolkien was voted the 92nd Greatest Britain, in a poll conducted by the BBC, and in 2004 he was voted 35th in the SABC 3's Great South Africans, the only person to appear in both lists. His popularity is not limited to the English-speaking world, in a 2004 poll inspired by the UK's Big Read survey, about 250,000 Germans found The Lord of the Rings to be their favourite work of literature. Tolkien wrote a brief sketch of the mythology, which included the tales of Beren and Luthien and of Turin, and that sketch eventually evolved into the Quenta Silmarillion, an epic history that Tolkien started three times but never published. Tolkien desperately hoped to publish it along with The Lord of the Rings, but publishers both Allen and Unwin and Collins declined. Moreover, printing costs were very high in 1950s Britain, requiring The Lord of the Rings to be published in three volumes. The story of this continuous redrafting is told in the posthumous series The History of Middle-earth, edited by Tolkien's son, Christopher Tolkien. From around 1936, Tolkien began to extend this framework to include the tale of the fall of Numenor, which was inspired by the legend of Atlantis. Tolkien appointed his son Christopher to be his literary executor, and he with assistance from Guy Gavriel Kay, later a well-known fantasy author in his own right organized some of this material into a single coherent volume published as The Silmarillion in 1977. It received the Locus Award for Best Fantasy Novel in 1978. In 1980, Christopher Tolkien published a collection of more fragmentary material, 
under the title Unfinished Tales of New Mena and Middle Earth. In subsequent years 1983 to 1996, he published a large amount of the remaining unpublished materials, together with notes and extensive commentary, in a series of 12 volumes called The History of Middle Earth. They contain unfinished, abandoned, alternative, and outright contradictory accounts, since they were always a work in progress for Tolkien and he only rarely settled on a definitive version for any of the stories. There is not complete consistency between The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, the two most closely related works, because Tolkien never fully integrated all their traditions into each other. He commented in 1965, while editing The Hobbit for a third edition, that he would have preferred to rewrite the book completely because of the style of its prose. Before his death, Tolkien negotiated the sale of the manuscripts, drafts, proofs and other materials related to his then-published works including The Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit and Farmer Giles of Ham to the Department of Special Collections and University Archives at Marquette University's John P. Rayner, S.J., Library in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. After his death his estate donated the papers containing Tolkien's Silmarillion mythology and his academic work to the Bodleian Library at Oxford University. The library held an exhibition of his work in 2018, including more than 60 items which had never been seen in public before. In 2009, a partial draft of Language and Human Nature, which Tolkien had begun co-writing with C. S. Lewis but had never completed, was discovered at the Bodleian Library. Both Tolkien's academic career and his literary production are inseparable from his love of language and philology. He specialized in English philology at university and in 1915 graduated with Old Norse as his special subject. He worked on the Oxford English Dictionary from 1918 and is credited with having worked on a number of words starting with the letter W, including walrus, over which he struggled mightily. In 1920, he became reader in English language at the University of Leeds, where he claimed credit for raising the number of students of linguistics from 5 to 20. He gave courses in Old English Heroic Verse, History of English, various Old English and Middle English texts, Old and Middle English philology, Introductory Germanic philology, Gothic, Old Icelandic, and Medieval Welsh. When in 1925, aged 33, Tolkien applied for the Rawlinson and Bosworth Professorship of Anglo-Saxon at Pembroke College, Oxford, he boasted that his students of Germanic philology in Leeds had even formed a Viking club. He also had a certain, if imperfect, knowledge of Finnish. Privately, Tolkien was attracted to things of racial and linguistic significance, and in his 1955 lecture English and Welsh, which is crucial to his understanding of race and language, he entertained notions of inherent linguistic predilections, which he termed the native language, as opposed to the cradle tongue, which a person first learns to speak. He considered the West Midlands dialect of Middle English to be his own, native language, and, as he wrote to W. H. Auden in 1955, I am a West Midlander by blood and took to early West Midland Middle English as a known tongue as soon as I set eyes on it. Parallel to Tolkien's professional work as a philologist, and sometimes overshadowing this work, to the effect that his academic output remained rather thin, was his affection for constructing languages. The most developed of these are Quenya and Sindarin, the etymological connection between which formed the core of much of Tolkien's legendarium. Language and grammar for Tolkien was a matter of aesthetics and euphony, and Quenya in particular was designed from phonesthetic considerations. It was intended as an elven Latin, and was phonologically based on Latin, with ingredients from Finnish, Welsh, English, and Greek. A notable addition came in late 1945 with Adenaic or Numenorian, a language of a faintly Semitic flavor, connected with Tolkien's Atlantis legend, 
which by the Notion Club papers ties directly into his ideas about the inability of language to be inherited, and via that second age, and the story of Arundel was grounded in the legendarium, thereby providing a link of Tolkien's 20th century, real primary world, with the legendary past of his Middle Earth. Tolkien considered languages inseparable from the mythology associated with them, and he consequently took a dim view of auxiliary languages. In 1930 a Congress of Esperantists were told as much by him, in his lecture A Secret Vice, your language construction will breed a mythology, but by 1956 he had concluded that, Volapük, Esperanto, Edo, Novial, and C, and C, are dead, far deader than ancient unused languages, because their authors never invented any Esperanto legends. The popularity of Tolkien's books has had a small but lasting effect on the use of language in fantasy literature in particular, and even on mainstream dictionaries, which today commonly accept Tolkien's idiosyncratic spellings dwarves and dwarvish alongside dwarfs and dwarfish, which had been little used since the mid-19th century and earlier. In fact, according to Tolkien, had the Old English plural survived, it would have been dwaros or dweros. He also coined the term eucatastrophe, though it remains mainly used in connection with his own work. Tolkien learnt to paint and draw as a child, and continued to do so all his adult life. From early in his writing career, the development of his stories was accompanied by drawings and paintings, especially of landscapes, and by maps of the lands in which the tales were set. He also produced pictures to accompany the stories told to his own children, including those later published in Mr. Bliss and Rove Random, and sent him elaborately illustrated letters purporting to come from Father Christmas. Although he regarded himself as an amateur, the publisher used the author's own cover art, his maps, and full-page illustrations for the early editions of The Hobbit. He prepared maps and illustrations for The Lord of the Rings, but the first edition contained only the maps, his calligraphy for the inscription on the One Ring, and his ink drawing of the Doors of Durin. Much of his artwork was collected and published in 1995 as a book, J. R. R. Tolkien, Artist and Illustrator. The book discusses Tolkien's paintings, drawings, and sketches, and reproduces approximately 200 examples of his work. Catherine McIlwain curated a major exhibition of Tolkien's artwork at the Bodleian Library, Tolkien, Maker of Middle-Earth, accompanied by a book of the same name that analyzes Tolkien's achievement and illustrates the full range of the types of artwork that he created. While many other authors had published works of fantasy before Tolkien, the great success of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings led directly to a popular resurgence and the shaping of the modern fantasy genre. This has caused Tolkien to be popularly identified as the father of modern fantasy literature or more precisely, of high fantasy, as in the work of authors such as Ursula Le Guin and her Earthsea series. In 2008, The Times ranked him sixth on a list of the 50 greatest British writers since 1945. His influence has extended to music, including the Danish group the Tolkien Ensemble's setting of all the poetry in The Lord of the Rings to their vocal music, and to a broad range of games. In a 1951 letter to publisher Milton Waldman, Tolkien wrote about his intentions to create a body of more or less connected legend, of which, the cycles should be linked to a majestic whole, and yet leave scope for other minds and hands, wielding paint and music and drama. The hands and minds of many artists have indeed been inspired by Tolkien's legends. Personally known to him were Pauline Baines Tolkien's favorite illustrator of the adventures of Tom Bombadil and Farmer Giles of Ham and Donald Swan who set the music to The Road Goes Ever On. Queen Margrethe II of Denmark created illustrations to The Lord of the Rings in the early 1970s. She sent him to Tolkien, who was struck by the similarity they bore in style to his own drawings. 
Tolkien was not implacably opposed to the idea of a dramatic adaptation, however, and sold the film, stage and merchandise rights of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings to United Artists in 1968. United Artists never made a film, although director John Borman was planning a live-action film in the early 1970s. In 1976, the rights were sold to Tolkien Enterprises, a division of the Saul Zaentz Company, and the first film adaptation of The Lord of the Rings was released in 1978 as an animated rotoscoping film directed by Ralph Bakshi with screenplay by the fantasy writer Peter S. Beagle. It covered only the first half of the story of The Lord of the Rings. In 1977, an animated musical television film of The Hobbit was made by Rankin Bass, and in 1980, they produced the animated musical television film The Return of the King, which covered some of the portions of The Lord of the Rings that Bakshi was unable to complete. From 2001 to 2003, New Line Cinema released The Lord of the Rings as a trilogy of live-action films that were filmed in New Zealand and directed by Peter Jackson. The series was successful, performing extremely well commercially and winning numerous Oscars. From 2012 to 2014, Warner Brothers and New Line Cinema released The Hobbit, a series of three films based on The Hobbit, with Peter Jackson serving as executive producer, director, and co-writer. The first installment, The Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey, was released in December 2012. The second, The Hobbit, The Desolation of Smaug, in December 2013. And the last installment, The Hobbit, The Battle of the Five Armies, in December 2014. In 2017, Amazon acquired the global television rights to The Lord of the Rings, for a series of new stories set before the Fellowship of the Ring. Tolkien and the characters and places from his works have become eponyms of many real-world objects. These include astronomical features such as on Saturn's moon Titan, street names such as There and Back Again Lane, inspired by The Hobbit, mountains such as Mount Shadowfax, Mount Gandalf and Mount Aragorn in Canada, companies such as Palantir Technologies, and species including the wasp Shireplitus tolkieni, 37 new species of Elachista moths, and many fossils. Since 2003, the Tolkien Society has organized Tolkien Reading Day, which takes place on the 25th of March in schools around the world. In 2013, Pembroke College, Oxford University established an annual lecture on fantasy literature in Tolkien's honor. In 2012, Tolkien was among the British cultural icons selected by artist Sir Peter Blake to appear in a new version of his most famous artwork, The Beatles Sergeant. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band album cover, to celebrate the British cultural figures of his life that he most admired. A 2019 biographical film, Tolkien, focused on Tolkien's early life and war experiences. The Tolkien family and estate stated that they did not approve of, authorize or participate in the making of the film. Several blue plaques in England that commemorate places associated with Tolkien, including for his childhood, his workplaces, and places he visited. Unlike other authors of the genre, Tolkien never favored signing his works. Owing to his popularity, hand-signed copies of his letters or of the first editions of his individual writings have however achieved high values at auctions, and forged autographs may occur on the market. For example, the signed first hardback edition of The Hobbit from 1937 has reportedly been offered for $85,000. Collectibles also include non-fiction books with handwritten annotations from Tolkien's private library. On 2 September 2017, the Oxford Oratory, Tolkien's parish church during his time in Oxford, offered its first mass for the intention of Tolkien's cause for beatification to be opened. A prayer was written for his cause. The Hobbit, 
or There and Back Again is a children's fantasy novel by English author J. R. R. Tolkien. It was published on 21 September 1937 to wide critical acclaim, being nominated for the Carnegie Medal and awarded a prize from the New York Herald Tribune for Best Juvenile Fiction. The book remains popular and is recognized as a classic in children's literature. The Hobbit is set within Tolkien's fictional universe and follows the quest of home-loving Bilbo Baggins, the titular Hobbit, to win a share of the treasure guarded by Smaug the Dragon. Bilbo's journey takes him from his light-hearted, rural surroundings into more sinister territory. The story is told in the form of an episodic quest, and most chapters introduce a specific creature or type of creature of Tolkien's geography. Bilbo gains a new level of maturity, competence, and wisdom by accepting the disreputable, romantic, fey, and adventurous sides of his nature and applying his wits and common sense. The story reaches its climax in the Battle of Five Armies, where many of the characters and creatures from earlier chapters re-emerge to engage in conflict. Personal growth and forms of heroism are central themes of the story, along with motifs of warfare. These themes have led critics to view Tolkien's own experiences during World War I as instrumental in shaping the story. The author's scholarly knowledge of Germanic philology and interest in mythology and fairy tales are often noted as influences. The publisher was encouraged by the book's critical and financial success and, therefore, requested a sequel. As Tolkien's work progressed on its successor, The Lord of the Rings, he made retrospective accommodations for it in The Hobbit. These few but significant changes were integrated into the second edition. Further editions followed with minor emendations, including those reflecting Tolkien's changing concept of the world into which Bilbo stumbled. The work has never been out of print. Its ongoing legacy encompasses many adaptations for stage, screen, radio, board games, and video games. Several of these adaptations have received critical recognition on their own merits. Bilbo Baggins, the titular protagonist, is a respectable, reserved hobbit, a race resembling very short humans with furry, leathery feet who live in underground houses and are mainly pastoral farmers and gardeners. During his adventure, Bilbo often refers to the contents of his larder at home and wishes he had more food. Until he finds a magic ring, he is more baggage than help. Gandalf, an itinerant wizard, introduces Bilbo to a company of thirteen dwarves. During the journey the wizard disappears on side errands dimly hinted it, only to appear again at key moments in the story. Thorin Oakenshield, the proud, pompous head of the company of dwarves and heir to the destroyed dwarvish kingdom under the Lonely Mountain, makes many mistakes in his leadership, relying on Gandalf and Bilbo to get him out of trouble, but proves himself a mighty warrior. Smaug is a dragon who long ago pillaged the dwarvish kingdom of Thorin's grandfather and sleeps upon the vast treasure. The plot involves a host of other characters of varying importance, such as the twelve other dwarves of the company, two types of elves, both puckish and more serious warrior types, men, man-eating trolls, boulder-throwing giants, evil cave-dwelling goblins, forest-dwelling giant spiders who can speak, immense and heroic eagles who also speak, evil wolves, or wargs, who are allied with the goblins, Elrond the Sage, Gollum, a strange creature inhabiting an underground lake, Bjorn, a man who can assume bear form, and Bard the Bowman, a grim but honorable archer of Lake Town. Gandalf tricks Bilbo Baggins into hosting a party for Thorin Oakenshield and his band of twelve dwarves, Dwalin, Balin, Keely, Philly, Dory, Nori, Ori, Oin, Gloin, Bifur, Bofur, and Bombor who sing of reclaiming the lonely mountain and its vast treasure from the dragon Smaug. When the music ends, 
Gandalf unveils Thros map showing a secret door into the mountain and proposes that the dumbfounded Bilbo serve as the expedition's burglar. The dwarves ridicule the idea, but Bilbo, indignant, joins despite himself. The group travels into the wild, where Gandalf saves the company from trolls and leads them to Rivendell, where Elrond reveals more secrets from the map. When they attempt to cross the Misty Mountains they are caught by goblins and driven deep underground. Although Gandalf rescues them, Bilbo gets separated from the others as they flee the goblins. Lost in the goblin tunnels, he stumbles across a mysterious ring and then encounters Gollum, who engages him in a game of riddles. As a reward for solving all riddles Gollum will show him the path out of the tunnels, but if Bilbo fails, his life will be forfeit. With the help of the ring, which confers invisibility, Bilbo escapes and rejoins the dwarves, improving his reputation with them. The goblins and wargs give chase, but the company are saved by eagles before resting in the house of Bjorn. The company enters the Black Forest of Mirkwood without Gandalf. In Mirkwood, Bilbo first saves the dwarves from giant spiders and then from the dungeons of the wood elves. Nearing the lonely mountain, the travelers are welcomed by the human inhabitants of Lake Town, who hope the dwarves will fulfill prophecies of Smaug's demise. The expedition reaches the mountain, and finds the secret door. Its moon letters can only be read on Durin's day by the last light of the setting sun. Bilbo scouts the dragon's lair, stealing a great cup and espying a gap in Smaug's armor. The enraged dragon, deducing that Lake Town has aided the intruder, sets out to destroy the town. A thrush had overheard Bilbo's report of Smaug's vulnerability and reports it to Lake Town defender Bard. Bard's arrow finds the hollow spot and kills the dragon. When the dwarves take possession of the mountain, Bilbo finds the Arkenstone, an heirloom of Thorin's family, and hides it away. The wood elves and lake men besiege the mountain and request compensation for their aid, reparations for Lake Town's destruction, and settlement of old claims on the treasure. Thorin refuses and, having summoned his kin from the Iron Hills, reinforces his position. Bilbo tries to ransom the Arkenstone to head off a war, but Thorin is only enraged at the betrayal. He banishes Bilbo, and battle seems inevitable. Gandalf reappears to warn all of an approaching army of goblins and wargs. The dwarves, men and elves band together, but only with the timely arrival of the eagles and Bjorn do they win the climactic battle of five armies. Thorin is fatally wounded and reconciles with Bilbo before he dies. Bilbo accepts only a small portion of his share of the treasure, having no want or need for more, but still returns home a very wealthy hobbit roughly a year and a month after he first left. He writes the story of his adventures. In the early 1930s Tolkien was pursuing an academic career at Oxford as Rawlinson and Bosworth Professor of Anglo-Saxon, with a fellowship at Pembroke College. Several of his poems had been published in magazines and small collections, including Goblin Feet and the Cat and the Fiddle, A Nursery Rhyme Undone and its Scandalous Secret Unlocked, a reworking of the nursery rhyme Hey Diddle Diddle. His creative endeavors at this time also included letters from Father Christmas to his children, illustrated manuscripts that featured warring gnomes and goblins, and a helpful polar bear, alongside the creation of elven languages and an attendant mythology, including the Book of Lost Tales, which he had been creating since 1917. These works all saw posthumous publication. In a 1955 letter to W. H. Auden, Tolkien recollects that he began work on The Hobbit one day early in the 1930s, when he was marking school certificate papers. He found a blank page. Suddenly inspired, he wrote the words, in a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. 
By late 1932 he had finished the story and then lent the manuscript to several friends, including C. S. Lewis and a student of Tolkien's named Elaine Griffiths. In 1936, when Griffiths was visited in Oxford by Susan Dagnall, a staff member of the publisher George Allen and Unwin, she is reported to have either lent Dagnall the book or suggested she borrow it from Tolkien. In any event, Dagnall was impressed by it, and showed the book to Stanley Unwin, who then asked his 10-year-old son Rainer to review it. Rainer's favorable comments settled Allen and Unwin's decision to publish Tolkien's book. The setting of The Hobbit, as described on its original dust jacket, is ancient time between the age of fairy and the dominion of men, in an unnamed fantasy world. The world is shown on the endpaper map as Western Lands, Westward and Wilderland as the East. Originally this world was self-contained, but as Tolkien began work on The Lord of the Rings, he decided these stories could fit into the legendarium he had been working on privately for decades. The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings became the end of the Third Age of Middle-earth within Arda. Eventually those tales of the earlier periods became published as The Silmarillion and other posthumous works. One of the greatest influences on Tolkien was the 19th-century arts and crafts polymath William Morris. Tolkien wished to imitate Morris's prose and poetry romances, following the general style and approach of the work. The Desolation of Smaug is portraying dragons as detrimental to landscape, has been noted as an explicit motif borrowed from Morris. Tolkien wrote also of being impressed as a boy by Samuel Rutherford Crockett's historical novel The Black Douglas and of basing the necromancer Sauron on its villain, Jill de Retz. Incidents in both The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings are similar in narrative and style to the novel, and its overall style and imagery have been suggested as having had an influence on Tolkien. Tolkien's portrayal of goblins in The Hobbit was particularly influenced by George MacDonald's The Princess and the Goblin. However, MacDonald influenced Tolkien more profoundly than just to shape individual characters and episodes. His works further helped Tolkien form his whole thinking on the role of fantasy within his Christian faith. Tolkien scholar Mark T. Hooker has catalogued a lengthy series of parallels between The Hobbit and Jules Verne's journey to the center of the Earth. These include, among other things, a hidden runic message and a celestial alignment that direct the adventurers to the goals of their quests. Tolkien's works show much influence from Norse mythology, reflecting his lifelong passion for those stories and his academic interest in Germanic philology. The Hobbit is no exception to this. The work shows influences from Northern European literature, myths and languages, especially from the Poetic Edda and the Prose Edda. Examples include the names of characters, such as Philly, Keely, Oin, Gloin, Bifer, Bofer, Bombur, Dori, Nori, Dwalin, Balan, Dane, Nain, Thorin Oakenshield and Gandalf deriving from the Old Norse names Fili, Kili, Oin, Gloi, Biver, Borvor, Bomber, Dori, Nori, Dwalin, Blorn, Dane, Nain, Orin Akinskialdi and Gandalva. But while their names are from Old Norse, the characters of the dwarves are more directly taken from fairy tales such as Snow White and Snow White and Rose Red as collected by the Brothers Grimm. The latter tale may also have influenced the character of Bjorn. Tolkien's use of descriptive names such as Misty Mountains and Bag End echoes the names used in Old Norse sagas. The names of the dwarf-friendly ravens, such as Roke, are derived from Old Norse words for raven and rook, but their peaceful characters are unlike the typical carrion birds from Old Norse and Old English literature. Tolkien is not simply skimming historical sources for effect. The juxtaposition of old and new styles of expression is seen by Shippey as one of the major themes explored in The Hobbit. Maps figure in both saga literature and The Hobbit. 
Several of the author's illustrations incorporate Anglo-Saxon runes, an English adaptation of the Germanic runic alphabets. Themes from Old English literature, and specifically from Beowulf, shape the ancient world Bilbo stepped into. Tolkien, a scholar of Beowulf, counted the epic among his most valued sources for The Hobbit. Tolkien was one of the first critics to treat Beowulf as a literary work with value beyond the merely historical, with his 1936 lecture Beowulf, The Monsters and the Critics. Tolkien borrowed several elements from Beowulf, including a monstrous, intelligent dragon. Certain descriptions in The Hobbit seem to have been lifted straight out of Beowulf with some minor rewording, such as when the dragon stretches its neck out to sniff for intruders. Likewise, Tolkien's descriptions of the lair as accessed through a secret passage mirror those in Beowulf. Other specific plot elements and features in The Hobbit that show similarities to Beowulf include the title Thief, as Bilbo is called by Gollum and later by Smaug, and Smaug's personality, which leads to the destruction of Lake Town. Tolkien refines parts of Beowulf's plot that he appears to have found less than satisfactorily described, such as details about the cup thief and the dragon's intellect and personality. Another influence from Old English sources is the appearance of named blades of renown, adorned in runes. In using his elf blade, Bilbo finally takes his first independent heroic action. By his naming the blade, Sting, we see Bilbo's acceptance of the kinds of cultural and linguistic practices found in Beowulf, signifying his entrance into the ancient world in which he found himself. This progression culminates in Bilbo stealing a cup from the dragon's hoard, rousing him to wrath, an incident directly mirroring Beowulf and an action entirely determined by traditional narrative patterns. As Tolkien wrote, the episode of the theft arose naturally and almost inevitably from the circumstances. It is difficult to think of any other way of conducting the story at this point. I fancy the author of Beowulf would say much the same. The name of the wizard Radagast is widely recognized to be taken from the name of the Slavic deity Rodegast. The representation of the dwarves in The Hobbit was influenced by his own selective reading of medieval texts regarding the Jewish people and their history. The dwarves' characteristics of being dispossessed of their ancient homeland at the Lonely Mountain, and living among other groups whilst retaining their own culture are all derived from the medieval image of Jews, whilst their warlike nature stems from accounts in the Hebrew Bible. The dwarvish calendar invented for the Hobbit reflects the Jewish calendar in beginning in late autumn. And although Tolkien denied allegory, the dwarves taking Bilbo out of his complacent existence has been seen as an eloquent metaphor for the impoverishment of Western society without Jews. George Allen and Unwin Limited of London published the first edition of The Hobbit on 21 September 1937 with a print run of 1,500 copies, which sold out by December because of enthusiastic reviews. This first printing was illustrated in black and white by Tolkien, who designed the dust jacket as well. Horton Mifflin of Boston and New York reset type for an American edition, to be released early in 1938, in which four of the illustrations would be color plates. Allen and Unwin decided to incorporate the color illustrations into their second printing, released at the end of 1937. Despite the book's popularity, paper rationing due to World War II and not ending until 1949 meant that the Allen and Unwin edition of the book was often unavailable during this period. Subsequent editions in English were published in 1951, 1966, 1978 and 1995. Numerous English-language editions of The Hobbit have been produced by several publishers. In addition, The Hobbit has been translated into over 60 languages, with more than one published version for some languages. In December 1937 The Hobbit's publisher, 
Stanley Unwin, asked Tolkien for a sequel. In response Tolkien provided drafts for The Silmarillion, but the editors rejected them, believing that the public wanted more about Hobbits. Tolkien subsequently began work on The New Hobbit, which would eventually become The Lord of the Rings, a course that would not only change the context of the original story, but lead to substantial changes to the character of Gollum. In the first edition of The Hobbit, Gollum willingly bets his magic ring on the outcome of the Riddle game, and he and Bilbo part amicably. In the second edition edits, to reflect the new concept of the One Ring and its corrupting abilities, Tolkien made Gollum more aggressive towards Bilbo and distraught at losing the ring. The encounter ends with Gollum's curse, thief, 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 Baggins. We hates it, we hates it, we hates it forever. This presages Gollum's portrayal in The Lord of the Rings. Tolkien sent this revised version of the chapter, Riddles in the Dark, to Unwin as an example of the kinds of changes needed to bring the book into conformity with The Lord of the Rings, but he heard nothing back for years. When he was sent galley proofs of a new edition, Tolkien was surprised to find the sample text had been incorporated. In The Lord of the Rings, the original version of the Riddle game is explained as a lie, made up by Bilbo under the harmful influence of the ring, whereas the revised version contains the true account. The revised text became the second edition, published in 1951 in both the UK and the US. Tolkien began a new version in 1960, attempting to adjust the tone of The Hobbit to its sequel. He abandoned the new revision at Chapter 3 after he received criticism that it just wasn't The Hobbit, implying it had lost much of its light-hearted tone and quick pace. After an unauthorized paperback edition of The Lord of the Rings appeared from Ace Books in 1965, Horton Mifflin and Ballantyne asked Tolkien to refresh the text of The Hobbit to renew the U.S. copyright. This text became the 1966 third edition. Tolkien took the opportunity to align the narrative even more closely to The Lord of the Rings and to cosmological developments from his still unpublished Quenta Silmarillion as it stood at that time. These small edits included, for example, changing the phrase, elves that are now called gnomes, from the first and second editions, on page 63, to high elves of the west, my kin, in the third edition. Tolkien had used gnome in his earlier writing to refer to the second kindred of the high elves the Noldor or deep elves, thinking gnome, derived from the Greek gnosis, was a good name for the wisest of the elves. However, because of its common denotation of a garden gnome, derived from the 16th century Paracelsus, Tolkien abandoned the term. He also changed tomatoes to pickles, but retained other anachronisms, such as clocks and tobacco. In The Lord of the Rings, he has Merry explain that tobacco had been brought from the West by the Numenorians. Since the author's death, two critical editions of The Hobbit have been published, providing commentary on the creation, emendation and development of the text. In The Annotated Hobbit, Douglas Anderson provides the text of the published book alongside commentary and illustrations. Later editions added the text of The Quest of Erebor. Anderson's commentary makes note of the sources Tolkien brought together in preparing the text, and chronicles the changes Tolkien made to the published editions. The text is also accompanied by illustrations from foreign language editions, among them work by Tove Jansen. With The History of the Hobbit, published in two parts in 2007, John D. Ratliff provides the full text of the earliest and intermediary drafts of the book, alongside commentary that shows relationships to Tolkien's scholarly and creative works, both contemporary and later. Ratliff provides the abandoned 1960s retelling and previously unpublished illustrations by Tolkien. The book separates commentary from Tolkien's text, allowing the reader to read the original drafts as self-contained stories.
Tolkien's correspondence and publishers' records show that he was involved in the design and illustration of the entire book. All elements were the subject of considerable correspondence and fussing over by Tolkien. Rainer Unwin, in his publishing memoir, comments, in 1937 alone Tolkien wrote 26 letters to George Allen and Unwin. Detailed, fluent, often pungent, but infinitely polite and exasperatingly precise. I doubt any author today, however famous, would get such scrupulous attention. Even the maps, of which Tolkien originally proposed five, were considered and debated. He wished Thro's map to be tipped in that is, glued in after the book has been bound at first mention in the text, and with the moon letter Sirth on the reverse so they could be seen when held up to the light. In the end the cost, as well as the shading of the maps, which would be difficult to reproduce, resulted in the final design of two maps as endpapers, Thro's map, and the map of Wilderland, both printed in black and red on the paper's cream background. Originally Allen and Unwin planned to illustrate the book only with the endpaper maps, but Tolkien's first tendered sketches so charmed the publisher's staff that they opted to include them without raising the book's price despite the extra cost. Thus encouraged, Tolkien supplied a second batch of illustrations. The publisher accepted all of these as well, giving the first edition ten black and white illustrations plus the two endpaper maps. The illustrated scenes were The Hill, Hobbiton Across the Water, The Trolls, The Mountain Path, The Misty Mountains Looking West from the Eyrie Towards Goblin Gate, Beyond's Hall, Mirkwood, The Elven King's Gate, Lake Town, The Front Gate, and The Hall at Bag End. All but one of the illustrations were a full page, and one, the Mirkwood illustration, required a separate plate. Satisfied with his skills, the publishers asked Tolkien to design a dust jacket. This project, too, became the subject of many iterations and much correspondence, with Tolkien always writing disparagingly of his own ability to draw. The runic inscription around the edges of the illustration are a phonetic transliteration of English, giving the title of the book and details of the author and publisher. The original jacket design contained several shades of various colors, but Tolkien redrew it several times using fewer colors each time. His final design consisted of four colors. The publishers, mindful of the cost, removed the red from the sun to end up with only black, blue, and green ink on white stock. The publisher's production staff designed a binding, but Tolkien objected to several elements. Through several iterations, the final design ended up as mostly the author's. The spine shows runes, two, thrine and thraw runes and one, d, door. The front and back covers were mirror images of each other, with an elongated dragon characteristic of Tolkien's style stamped along the lower edge, and with a sketch of the misty mountains stamped along the upper edge. Once illustrations were approved for the book, Tolkien proposed color plates as well. The publisher would not relent on this, so Tolkien pinned his hopes on the American edition to be published about six months later. Horton Mifflin rewarded these hopes with the replacement of the frontispiece The Hill, Hobbiton Across the Water in Color and the addition of new color plates, Rivendell, Bilbo woke up with the early sun in his eyes, Bilbo comes to the huts of the raft elves and conversation with Smaug, which features a dwarvish curse written in Tolkien's invented script Tengwa, and signed with two, th, runes. The additional illustrations proved so appealing that George Allen and Unwin adopted the color plates as well for their second printing, with exception of Bilbo woke up with the early sun in his eyes. Different editions have been illustrated in diverse ways. Many follow the original scheme at least loosely, but many others are illustrated by other artists, especially the many translated editions. Some cheaper editions, particularly paperback, are not illustrated except with the maps. 
The Children's Book Club edition of 1942 includes the black and white pictures but no maps, an anomaly. Tolkien's use of runes, both as decorative devices and as magical signs within the story, has been cited as a major cause for the popularization of runes within New Age and esoteric literature, stemming from Tolkien's popularity with the elements of counterculture in the 1970s. The Hobbit takes cues from narrative models of children's literature, as shown by its omniscient narrator and characters that young children can relate to, such as the small, food-obsessed, and morally ambiguous Bilbo. The text emphasizes the relationship between time and narrative progress and it openly distinguishes, safe, from dangerous, in its geography. Both are key elements of works intended for children, as is the home away home, or there and back again plot structure typical of the building's Roman. While Tolkien later claimed to dislike the aspect of the narrative voice addressing the reader directly, the narrative voice contributes significantly to the success of the novel. Ema O'Sullivan, in her comparative children's literature, notes The Hobbit as one of a handful of children's books that have been accepted into mainstream literature, alongside Jostein Garda's Sophie's World 1991 and J. K. Rowling's Harry Potter series 1997-2007. Tolkien intended The Hobbit as a fairy story and wrote it in a tone suited to addressing children although he said later that the book was not specifically written for children but had rather been created out of his interest in mythology and legend. Many of the initial reviews refer to the work as a fairy story. However, according to Jack Zipper's writing in the Oxford Companion to Fairy Tales, Bilbo is an atypical character for a fairy tale. The work is much longer than Tolkien's ideal proposed in his essay on fairy stories. Many fairy tale motifs, such as the repetition of similar events seen in the dwarves' arrival at Bilbo's and Beyond's homes, and folklore themes, such as trolls turning to stone, are to be found in the story. The book is popularly called and often marketed as a fantasy novel, but like Peter Pan and Wendy by J. M. Barry and the Princess and the Goblin by George MacDonald, both of which influenced Tolkien and contain fantasy elements, it is primarily identified as being children's literature. The two genres are not mutually exclusive, so some definitions of high fantasy include works for children by authors such as L. Frank Baum and Lloyd Alexander alongside the works of Gene Wolfe and Jonathan Swift which are more often considered adult literature. The Hobbit has been called the most popular of all 20th century fantasies written for children. Jane Chance, however, considers the book to be a children's novel only in the sense that it appeals to the child in an adult reader. Sullivan credits the first publication of The Hobbit as an important step in the development of high fantasy, and further credits the 1960s paperback debuts of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings as essential to the creation of a mass market for fiction of this kind as well as the fantasy genre's current status. Tolkien's prose is unpretentious and straightforward taking as given the existence of his imaginary world and describing its details in a matter-of-fact way, while often introducing the new and fantastic in an almost casual manner. This down-to-earth style, also found in later fantasy such as Richard Adams' Watership Down and Peter Beagle's The Last Unicorn, accepts readers into the fictional world, rather than cajoling or attempting to convince them of its reality. While The Hobbit is written in a simple, friendly language, each of its characters has a unique voice. The narrator, who occasionally interrupts the narrative flow with asides a device common to both children's and Anglo-Saxon literature, has his own linguistic style separate from those of the main characters. The basic form of the story is that of a quest, told in episodes. For the most part of the book, each chapter introduces a different denizen of the Wilderland, some helpful and friendly towards the protagonists, and others threatening or dangerous. 
However the general tone is kept light-hearted, being interspersed with songs and humor. One example of the use of song to maintain tone is when Thorin and company are kidnapped by goblins, who, when marching them into the underworld, sing, clap, snap, the black crack, grip, grab, pinch, nab, and down down to goblin town you go, my lad. This onomatopoeic singing undercuts the dangerous scene with a sense of humor. Tolkien achieves balance of humor and danger through other means as well, as seen in the foolishness and cockney dialect of the trolls and in the drunkenness of the elven captors. The general form that of a journey into strange lands, told in a light-hearted mood and interspersed with songs may be following the model of the Icelandic journals by William Morris, an important literary influence on Tolkien. The evolution and maturation of the protagonist, Bilbo Baggins, is central to the story. This journey of maturation, where Bilbo gains a clear sense of identity and confidence in the outside world, may be seen as a building's Roman rather than a traditional quest. The Jungian concept of individuation is also reflected through this theme of growing maturity and capability with the author contrasting Bilbo's personal growth against the arrested development of the dwarves. Thus, while Gandalf exerts a parental influence over Bilbo early on, it is Bilbo who gradually takes over leadership of the party, a fact the dwarves could not bear to acknowledge. The analog of the underworld, and the hero returning from it with a boon such as the ring, or elvish blades that benefits his society is seen to fit the mythic archetypes regarding initiation and male coming of age as described by Joseph Campbell. Chance compares the development and growth of Bilbo against other characters to the concepts of just kingship versus sinful kingship derived from the Ancrene Wiss which Tolkien had written on in 1929, and a Christian understanding of Beowulf, a text that influenced Tolkien's writing. The overcoming of greed and selfishness has been seen as the central moral of the story. Whilst greed is a recurring theme in the novel, with many of the episodes stemming from one or more of the characters' simple desire for food be it trolls eating dwarves or dwarves eating wood elf fare or a desire for beautiful objects, such as gold and jewels, it is only by the Arkenstone's influence upon Thorin that greed, and its attendant vices, coveting, and malignancy, come fully to the fore in the story and provide the moral crux of the tale. Bilbo steals the Arkenstone a most ancient relic of the dwarves and attempts to ransom it to Thorin for peace. However, Thorin turns on the Hobbit as a traitor, disregarding all the promises and, at your services, he had previously bestowed. In the end Bilbo gives up the precious stone and most of his share of the treasure to help those in greater need. Tolkien also explores the motif of jewels that inspire intense greed that corrupts those who covet them in the Silmarillion, and there are connections between the words, Arkenstone, and Silmaril in Tolkien's invented etymologies. The Hobbit employs themes of animism, an important concept in anthropology and child development. Animism is the idea that all things including inanimate objects and natural events, such as storms or purses, as well as living things like animals and plants possess human-like intelligence. John D. Ratliff calls this the Dr. Doolittle theme, in the history of The Hobbit, and cites the multitude of talking animals as indicative of this theme. These talking creatures include ravens, a thrush, spiders and the dragon Smaug, alongside the anthropomorphic goblins and elves. Patrick Curry notes that animism is also found in Tolkien's other works, and mentions the roots of mountains and feet of trees in The Hobbit as a linguistic shifting in level from the inanimate to animate. Tolkien saw the idea of animism as closely linked to the emergence of human language and myth. The first men to talk of trees and stars saw things very differently. To them, the world was alive with mythological beings. To them the whole of creation was myth-woven and elf-patterned. As in plot and setting, 
Tolkien brings his literary theories to bear in forming characters and their interactions. He portrays Bilbo as a modern anachronism exploring an essentially antique world. Bilbo is able to negotiate and interact within this antique world because language and tradition make connections between the two worlds. For example, Gollum's riddles are taken from old historical sources, while those of Bilbo come from modern nursery books. It is the form of the riddle game, familiar to both, which allows Gollum and Bilbo to engage each other, rather than the content of the riddles themselves. This idea of a superficial contrast between characters' individual linguistic style, tone and sphere of interest, leading to an understanding of the deeper unity between the ancient and modern, is a recurring theme in The Hobbit. Smaug is the main antagonist. In many ways the Smaug episode reflects and references the dragon of Beowulf, and Tolkien uses the episode to put into practice some of the groundbreaking literary theories he had developed about the Old English poem in its portrayal of the dragon as having bestial intelligence. Tolkien greatly prefers this motif over the later medieval trend of using the dragon as a symbolic or allegorical figure, such as in the legend of St. George. Smaug the dragon with his golden horde may be seen as an example of the traditional relationship between evil and metallurgy as collated in the depiction of pandemonium with its belched fire and rolling smoke, in John Milton's Paradise Lost. Of all the characters, Smaug's speech is the most modern, using idioms such as don't let your imagination run away with you. Just as Tolkien's literary theories have been seen to influence the tale, so have Tolkien's experiences. The Hobbit may be read as Tolkien's parable of World War I with the hero being plucked from his rural home and thrown into a far-off war where traditional types of heroism are shown to be futile. The tale as such explores the theme of heroism. As Janet Brennan Croft notes, Tolkien's literary reaction to war at this time differed from most post-war writers by eschewing irony as a method for distancing events and instead using mythology to mediate his experiences. Similarities to the works of other writers who faced the Great War are seen in The Hobbit, including portraying warfare as anti-pastoral, in The Desolation of Smaug, both the area under the influence of Smaug before his demise and the setting for the Battle of Five Armies later are described as barren, damaged landscapes. The Hobbit makes a warning against repeating the tragedies of World War I, and Tolkien's attitude as a veteran may well be summed up by Bilbo's comment, victory after all, I suppose. Well, it seems a very gloomy business. On first publication in October 1937, The Hobbit was met with almost unanimously favorable reviews from publications both in the UK and the US, including The Times, Catholic World and New York Post. C. S. Lewis, friend of Tolkien and later author of The Chronicles of Narnia between 1949 and 1954, writing in The Times reports, the truth is that in this book a number of good things, never before united, have come together, a fund of humor, an understanding of children, and a happy fusion of the scholars with the poet's grasp of mythology. The professor has the air of inventing nothing. He has studied trolls and dragons at first hand and describes them with that fidelity that is worth oceans of glib originality. Lewis compares the book to Alice in Wonderland in that both children and adults may find different things to enjoy in it, and places it alongside Flatland, Fantastes, and The Wind in the Willows. W. H. Auden, in his review of the sequel The Fellowship of the Ring, calls The Hobbit one of the best children's stories of this century. Auden was later to correspond with Tolkien, and they became friends. The Hobbit was nominated for the Carnegie Medal and awarded a prize from the New York Herald Tribune for Best Juvenile Fiction of the Year 1938. More recently, the book has been recognized as most important 20th century novel for older readers in the Children's Books of the Century poll in Books for Keeps.
Publication of the sequel The Lord of the Rings altered many critics' reception of the work. Instead of approaching The Hobbit as a children's book in its own right, critics such as Randall Helms picked up on the idea of The Hobbit as being a prelude, relegating the story to a dry run for the later work. Countering a presentist interpretation are those who say this approach misses out on much of the original's value as a children's book and as a work of high fantasy in its own right, and that it disregards the book's influence on these genres. Commentators such as Paul Cocker, John D. Ratliff and C. W. Sullivan encourage readers to treat the works separately, both because The Hobbit was conceived, published, and received independently of the later work, and to avoid dashing readers' expectations of tone and style. While The Hobbit has been adapted and elaborated upon in many ways, its sequel The Lord of the Rings is often claimed to be its greatest legacy. The plots share the same basic structure progressing in the same sequence. The stories begin at Bag End, the home of Bilbo Baggins, Bilbo hosts a party that sets the novel's main plot into motion. Gandalf sends the protagonist into a quest eastward. Elrond offers a haven and advice. The adventurers escape dangerous creatures underground Goblin Town, Moria. They engage another group of elves Mirkwood, Lothlorien. They traverse a desolate region Desolation of Smaug, the Dead Marshes. They are received and nourished by a small settlement of men Eskaroth. Athelion. They fight in a massive battle the Battle of Five Armies, Battle of Pelena Fields. The journey climaxes within an infamous mountain peak Lonely Mountain, Mount Doom. A descendant of kings is restored to his ancestral throne bard, Aragorn, and the questing party returns home to find it in a deteriorated condition having possessions auctioned off, the scouring of the Shire. The Lord of the Rings contains several more supporting scenes, and has a more sophisticated plot structure, following the paths of multiple characters. Tolkien wrote the later story in much less humorous tones and infused it with more complex moral and philosophical themes. The differences between the two stories can cause difficulties when readers, expecting them to be similar, find that they are not. Many of the thematic and stylistic differences arose because Tolkien wrote The Hobbit as a story for children, and The Lord of the Rings for the same audience, who had subsequently grown up since its publication. Further, Tolkien's concept of Middle-earth was to continually change and slowly evolve throughout his life and writings. The style and themes of the book have been seen to help stretch young readers' literacy skills, preparing them to approach the works of Dickens and Shakespeare. By contrast, offering advanced younger readers modern teenage-oriented fiction may not exercise their reading skills, while the material may contain themes more suited to adolescents. As one of several books that have been recommended for 11 to 14-year-old boys to encourage literacy in that demographic, the Hobbit is promoted as the original and still the best fantasy ever written. Several teaching guides and books of study notes have been published to help teachers and students gain the most from the book. The Hobbit introduces literary concepts, notably allegory, to young readers, as the work has been seen to have allegorical aspects reflecting the life and times of the author. Meanwhile, the author himself rejected an allegorical reading of his work. This tension can help introduce readers to readily and writerly interpretations, to tenets of new criticism, and critical tools from Freudian analysis, such as sublimation, in approaching literary works. Another approach to critique taken in the classroom has been to propose the insignificance of female characters in the story as sexist. While Bilbo may be seen as a literary symbol of small folk of any gender, a gender-conscious approach can help students establish notions of a socially symbolic text, where meaning is generated by tendentious readings of a given work. By this interpretation, it is ironic that the first authorized adaptation was a stage production in a girls' school. 
The first authorized adaptation of The Hobbit appeared in March 1953, a stage production by St. Margaret's School, Edinburgh. The Hobbit has since been adapted for other media many times. The first motion picture adaptation of The Hobbit, a 12-minute film of cartoon stills, was commissioned from Gene Deitch by William L. Snyder in 1966, as related by Deitch himself. This film was publicly screened in New York City. In 1969 over 30 years after first publication, Tolkien sold the film and merchandising rights to The Hobbit to United Artists under an agreement stipulating a lump sum payment of £10,000 plus a 7.5% royalty after costs, payable to Allen and Unwin and the author. In 1976 three years after the author's death United Artists sold the rights to Saul Zaentz Company, who trade as Middle Earth Enterprises. Since then all authorized adaptations have been signed off by Middle Earth Enterprises. In 1997 Middle Earth Enterprises licensed the film rights to Miramax, which assigned them in 1998 to New Line Cinema. Tolkien's heirs, including his son Christopher, filed suit against New Line Cinema in February 2008 seeking payment of profits and to be entitled to cancel all future rights of New Line. To produce, distribute, and or exploit future films based upon the trilogy and or the films. And or, films based on The Hobbit. In September 2009, the Tolkien Trust and New Line reached an undisclosed settlement, and the legal objection to The Hobbit films was withdrawn. The BBC Radio 4 series The Hobbit Radio Drama was an adaptation by Michael Kilgariff, broadcast in eight parts four hours in total from September to November 1968. It starred Anthony Jackson as narrator, Paul Daneman as Bilbo and Heron Carvick as Gandalf. The series was released on audio cassette in 1988 and on CD in 1997. The Hobbit an animated version of the story produced by Rankin, Bass, debuted as a television movie in the United States in 1977. In 1978, Romeo Muller won a Peabody Award for his teleplay for The Hobbit. The film was also nominated for the Hugo Award for Best Dramatic Presentation, but lost to Star Wars. The adaptation has been called execrable and confusing for those not already familiar with the plot. A children's opera was written and premiered in 2004. Composer and librettist Dean Burry was commissioned by the Canadian Children's Opera Chorus, who produced the premiere in Toronto, Ontario, and subsequently toured it to the Maritime Provinces the same year. The opera has since been produced several times in North America including in Tulsa, Sarasota and Toronto. In Decembers of 2012, 2013, and 2014, Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and New Line Cinema released one part each of a three-part live-action film version produced and directed by Peter Jackson. The titles were The Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey, The Hobbit, the Desolation of Smaug, and The Hobbit, The Battle of the Five Armies. A three-part comic book adaptation with script by Chuck Dixon and Sean Deming and illustrated by David Wenzel was published by Eclipse Comics in 1989. In 1990 a one-volume edition was released by Unwin Paperbacks. The cover was artwork by the original illustrator David Wenzel. A reprint collected in one volume was released by Del Rey Books in 2001. Its cover, illustrated by Donato Giancola, was awarded the Association of Science Fiction Artists Award for Best Cover Illustration in 2002. In 1999, The Hobbit, a 3D pop-up adventure was published, with illustrations by John Howe and paper engineering by Andrew Barron. Middle Earth Strategic Gaming formerly Middle Earth Play-by-Mail, which has won several Origins Awards, 
uses the Battle of Five Armies as an introductory scenario to the full game and includes characters and armies from the book. Several computer and video games, both licensed and unlicensed, have been based on the story. One of the most successful was The Hobbit, an award-winning computer game published in 1982 by Beam Software and published by Melbourne House with compatibility for most computers available at the time. A copy of the novel was included in each game package. The game does not retell the story, but rather sits alongside it, using the book's narrative to both structure and motivate gameplay. The game won the Golden Joystick Award for Strategy Game of the Year in 1983 and was responsible for popularizing the phrase, Thorin sits down and starts singing about gold. While reliable figures are difficult to obtain, estimated global sales of The Hobbit run between 35 and 100 million copies since 1937. In the UK The Hobbit has not retreated from the top 5,000 best-selling books measured by Nielsen Book Scan since 1998, when the index began, achieving a three-year sales peak rising from 33,084, 2,000 to 142,541, 2001, 126,771, 2002 and 61,229 2003, ranking it at the third position in Nielsen's Evergreen book list. The enduring popularity of The Hobbit makes early printings of the book attractive collector's items. The first printing of the first English language edition can sell for between £6,000 and £20,000 at auction although the price for a signed first edition has reached over £60,000.